It is the pastor's heart and Dominic Steele and today church discipline and the law. Our guests are Robert Forsyth and Neil Foster. What advice is there for ministers navigating contemporary defamation law as we attempt to follow the Bible's teachings in how to bring about church discipline? Bishop Robert Forsyth is the former Anglican Bishop of South Sydney and Associate Professor Neil Foster is on the faculty of the University of Newcastle and is the author of the popular Law and Religion blog. He's also the author of a string of academic titles, including this textbook on defamation, which mentions Robert Forsyth, that's called Defamation and Wrongful Interference with Goods. And look, at a disclosure, Robert Forsyth was mentioned as the lead defendant in a defamation case over a decade ago involving a parishioner who was taking initially legal action against Robert Forsyth and me, but then subsequently just me. Uh, one of our Pastor's Heart audience wrote to me asking if we could do an episode on lessons learned during that difficult season. And so Robert and I are going to relive a particularly difficult season in our lives. And Neil is going to bring expert commentary. We have linked to the judgment on that case by Supreme Court Justice Carolyn Simpson in the show notes of this episode. And look, can I urge you to be circumspect in discussing this episode? We have been and are um, very deliberate and careful in our choice of words. We're confident in what we're saying here, but we just want to warn you against making any kind of maverick comments on social media. And nothing in this episode should be taken as legal advice for you. Robert, um, if I could start with you and the pastor's heart and, uh, and really what goes through our hearts as pastors in this tortuous issue of church discipline. Well, it's, it's, it's one level, it's so easy to pick up Matthew 18, our Lord's words, and here's a process, mm. you know, to tell the person to bring somebody else, then tell it to the church. The realities of genuine life in, in Australia in the 21st century is much more complex than that, so I urge people not to simply We take, do want to do the first two steps, though, don't we? Well, yes, in it, every case, this requires judgment and wisdom, not merely following a rule book. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing, I mm -hmm. think, how you apply it. Um, because every, every situation is complex and difficult. And I think we're going in with, the Bible says, I will therefore do, without thinking how, what effect will this have? What, what's the implications of this? Let alone the legal matters, which mm. we'll come to in a moment. It, it's not the way to proceed. You, we need to, pastors need to both protect the purity of the church and the, and the people in the church, as well as seek to get the restitution of those who are in trouble in, a, in being faithful disciples. Mm. And what's super helpful about Matthew 18 is it's about restoration. Of course, of it's not about punishment. You can get things in 1 Corinthians 5 when a person is not to be eaten with, but even there it's to re it's, it's, it's the long-term long -term goal, goal is restore. Mm -hmm. So I feel my first point is, yes, we must use uh, the, the biblical principles, we must understand them in depth, but we must not simply take them unthinkingly and go out there and think that if you just follow these rules simply, all will be well. Mm. Now, in terms of follow the rules, first rule, go and talk to the person. That's not a bad rule. A very good rule. Um, but even what you say, what you say needs to be thought about. Yeah. S second rule from Jesus, um, maybe if, if you don't get resolution on the first initial conversation, go and have a second with one or two others. Bring, bring, bring it up. It, it's, it's where we get to the third thing. Yes, of, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church that I think the man who wrote the textbook on <laughs> defamation is going to say to the bishop, um, well, what are you going to say to the bishop at that point? <laughs> well, uh, in broad terms, the, the principle is um, that is, I think, um, both lawful and godly is to tell the people who need to know, um, tell people who need to know. And so if you yes. are, um, because the way that the, and I'll come, I'll try and unpack the law of defamation a little bit in a moment, but the, the particular defence that you are going to rely on is a defence called qualified privilege. And uh, there are a couple of different versions of it, but most of them involve um, the fact that um, the person who, who says something has a duty or a good reason to say it, and the person who, people who hear it have a good reason to hear it. And uh, so the law will say, yes, you'll be protected if the people you're speaking to have a good reason to and know. And it's no good taking Matthew 18 to the law court and saying, look, Jesus said I've got to tell the church. <laughs> well, and, and right. I, I right? very much appreciate your, your comments, Rob, about the fact that it's, very, it's a nuanced judgment, I think, so that, uh, I mean, we could range over a whole different lot of areas, but it depends on the type of sin, for example, mm -hmm. that a person has been caught in. Um, and um, as yes. I say, who needs to respond? You might 
I mean, I, just in theory, you might have somebody who's, who's known to be a, a child abuser, and maybe everybody in the congregation needs to be aware of that in some context so that they, uh, children aren't exposed to a person. But it may be that the person is uh, committed sins against a smaller group of people within the church. It's those people who have pastoral responsibility for those people who might need to be told. So it's very hard to make general rules, but um, Plus I'd add, the principles depends. are there. The, uh, the led wrongdoing, what is the general society view of it, right? If I, if, I, if, I, if I sat my treasurer because he was, that's fair enough. If I go to the youth group because he uh, expressed homosexual views or something, then the danger of that pushback, the person goes to the press, quite serious. So where we're not in step with the society, more thought needs to be given because you know the outsider will regard it as unjust in a way they won't regard sacking a fraudster or a, ch or a child abuser unjust. Mm. That yeah. makes it harder, I think, Dominic. Mm. Yeah. Um, I was a young minister and um, found a complex pastoral situation. You were my bishop, Robert. Yes. And, uh, um, and actually it was one of the areas where I thought, hey, this would be a really good area for me to seek advice from somebody who is older and wiser and uh, was able to speak into the pastoral actions that, that I was doing. And um, uh, I mean, the case, it's actually called Haddon versus Forsyth. I'm very mm -hmm. pleased about that. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it called that, Neil? Um, the, my understanding is that the, um, uh, Mr. Haddon, uh, whom we call the plaintiff, the one who's mm -hmm. seeking a remedy, uh, initially sued a number of different people and took the view, I think, that Bishop Forsyth, as the ultimate supervisor of the Anglican area, was the, you know, the first one yes. to put on the list. You, you as pastor were on the list. Uh, there was somebody else, I think, who was, mm. was an elder or some a senior person in the church. Well, here, here, here's the problem. They thought I had control over Dominic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> therefore right. I was vicariously liable for his behaviour. Well, that lawyer thought that obviously didn't understand how the Anglican church works. Now, <laughs> that was actually a very significant judgment that, that a court of the land very early on said, actually, no, a bishop is not able to direct a rector. Um, no. and I, I don't think that emerges in the judgment. No. It's, no. it's a decision that I think that was made at behind, a previous hearing. The reason the is you're, you like were that. not my employee. That's the point. Yeah. If, if, yeah. if you're my employee, maybe then I could have some curious, mm. but the relationship between bishop and, and minister is a more subtle, nuanced pastoral. Yeah, so I sought simply, Robert's advice, mm. but, hadn't, but he wasn't able to say, you must do this yes, you know, in yes. the way an employee would. Um, yeah. I'd be happy to come back and talk to you again at another stage about vicarious liability and how it applies between bishops and clergy, ah, Dominic, cool. because that's a, <laughs> I see. that's a developing area of the law and there are one or two recent decisions in Australia which are not very encouraging in that area. But I, that is a separate issue here okay, because, cool. in effect, what happened at an early stage, it was agreed that um, Bishop Forsyth would not be actively involved no. in, in the litigation, mm. but his name stayed as the, as the, at the top of the list, as and, it were. And it's a very, it was a very significant thing for me that even though Robert wasn't a defendant in that court case um, and really had nothing else to do with it except his name mm -hmm. on the top of it, he actually sat next to me for four weeks mm. in the Supreme Court mm. at an extraordinarily difficult uh, time in my life. Mm. And uh, mm. I have um, uh, many times mm. said thank you to him mm. for, very kind of you. Um, for the kindness that he expressed to okay. me at that, during that season. Very kind. Yeah. What key principle, I think, I think we turned you from being an independent to Episcopalian. In, in <laughs> well, it, it, it did actually, it, in terms of, um, uh, I, I came to see the value of the network uh, in a way that I hadn't In fact, before. and can this be an important learning point here, that learning that a, a minister in his, in his or her parish must be aware that you must seek help in these matters. You mustn't try and do it yourself. Mm. And there are many resources, certainly here in the Diocese of Sydney, and in Diocese of Sydney, there are very good resources. And therefore getting those resources is very helpful because the thing I discovered in this case and another one before that is that common sense is no guide to the law. <laughs> and if you say something you mean well, you're not trying to hurt the other person, but the words could be taken, not what you meant, but what could someone think they meant under certain circumstances? Mm. And Another case I don't want to go into now, but the case where we tried very hard to protect the person we were, the minister was standing down from it from a position, and our very general phrases to protect the person meant that we may have been liable. We settled this one out of court. It'd be better if we'd gone and be absolutely explicit. 
which we wouldn't want to do because it would shame the person. Mm -hmm. So the key thing is get advice because in matters of defamation, am I right, common sense is not the best guide. Um, defamation is notorious amongst, even amongst uh, tort lawyers, it's a, it's a tort action. Tort for, means? For, for, tort means um, it's, a, it's a civil wrong. Thank you. Thank suing you. Mm -hmm. people for civil wrongs. Defamation is notorious for being complex. Um, it was once described as the, uh, the Galapagos Island um, jurisdiction in tort law, it's sort of on its own with its own rules. Yes. Um, and uh, yes, um, it, even a, a person who's very experienced in the civil law will say, go and see the specialist because it does have its own and secondly, norms. Secondly, and rules. even though Dominic did that, and I give advice, not the only person giving advice, I didn't prevent him from having to go through the, the problems. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And in the other case, um, I probably helped the problem by, by not thinking about what I was doing and encouraging. I've now learned that. And although that was settled, the damage, the, the cost for the ministers in both cases is quite severe. So it's, it's very hard mm. to, uh, even, even though you're vindicated, mm. it didn't mean you, you, you got off free from mm. that. Mm. No. So um, uh, the, I was sued over an email that I sent to a small group of people, 12 or so people, and I thought I might read the email mm -hmm. and then you could explain, if you like, the argument against us and then the argument in defence. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the email was, Dear Bruce, we were disappointed that after Dominic and Evans' meeting with you last Sunday, 10th of February, where you agreed to a requested conduct agreement in regards to relations with women, you broke that agreement a number of times after church finished on Sunday night. In the meeting on Sunday, Dominic and Evan raised concerns about your conduct towards women and your negative theological impact on our church family. You will remember that after a number of complaints from women, Dominic and Evan asked you to a not lead conversations towards sexual matters or make comments to women about their appearance, dress, weight, tan, hair, body shape, legs, neck, etc. b not to touch or kiss women at church, c not to focus your social interactions on women and to avoid women new to church, and d to focus your social interactive time with men of long standing in our church fellowship. Given that, after agreeing to that conduct agreement, you broke it a number of times 90 minutes later, I need to ask you not to join us this Sunday night while we work out how to approach this problem. And also we think it would be best if you didn't plan to join us on the church weekend away later this month. Thanks for your assistance. Now, that was an email that I had written and it wasn't Dominic in a maverick moment. It was Dominic no. consulting Robert, my bishop, consulting and, and the Archbishop Peter Jensen said to me later, he said, well, we can't ask much more of you young blokes when you ring up and ask what to do and we tell you what to do. And if what you've done turns out to be wrong, well, actually, it wasn't you that were wrong. It was our system that was wrong. But I, I sent that email, and 18 months later, I was the defendant in a court case. Over to you, Professor Foster. Which found you hadn't done wrong, by the Which way. Which found I hadn't done wrong. Yeah. Yes, to avoid perhaps, you know, what, what do they say? Spoiler warning. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler warning is that Dominic won the case. Um, so the law of defamation... Um, uh, protects your reputation with others. That's the that's the underlying uh, thing that's protected by this by this this tort action. Mm -hmm. Other tort actions present other things. The law of defamation protects reputation. It's a highly structured uh, system where you've got an, an initial stage where you have to work out whether what's been said is defamatory, and then secondly, there are a number of defences that can be applied mm -hmm. because in all this area, what the law is doing is balancing out. People's right to have a good reputation and not for that not to be impaired by lies. But secondly, people's right to free speech. And so the idea that we want to be able to allow people to speak mm. freely. And so these are two values which have to be held in tension by the law of defamation. The first part, the, the question of whether it's defamatory, um, the court will uh, says it takes its three elements. Uh, you have to ask, was what was said defamatory? Secondly, was it, uh, did it identify uh, the person who's complaining, the plaintiff? And thirdly, um, was it published? Now, the second and third bits there are quite clear here. It was clearly identified, Mr. Haddon, it clearly was published to um, people. Now, now, this is where I think quite a few people, not, not um, 
uh, not me and my immediate circle, mm. but as people asked me about it later, that it hadn't occurred to them that sending an email is publication, is publishing. And yeah. just to a small group of people. It, it, oh, sending yeah. an email to a group yeah. of yes. 10, mm. 12 people mm. is publication. Absolutely. So it is, and then this has been the law for a very long time, you don't have to put something in the Sydney Morning Herald for it to be published for the law of defamation. All you have to do wow. is to convey that information to someone other than the plaintiff. Mm. And so even, even saying it to one other person can be defamatory. So if I tell you in your presence, I think you're harassed, then that's okay. If I say, Robert, Neil's harassed, that's <laughs> not okay. That's right. The law of defamation is not, doesn't deal with insult, personal insult in the sense that I may be highly offended by something you say directly to me, mm -hmm. but that's not defamatory. Um, in the sense that I can't sue because it hasn't mm -hmm. been published to someone else, but it's published Tell to me. someone else, it can be. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, and so what we're seeing, of course, is that over the last decade or so, with the rise of social media, there's so many more opportunities to say things that are negative about others, that are heard yes, by yes, others yes. on social media, yes. that we have seen a real rocketing rise of defamation actions brought in relation to social media. Mm. Mm. And, and, and at the moment, there's inquiries trying to work out, well, how can we deal with this situation? Because we've got a, a number of cases where people have had serious, and I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars of damages mm. against something that they've said on social media. So, yeah. so publication can be to anyone. And we're actually now yeah. talking kind of 2008, which is really before the age mm. of social media, mm. but some of the principles are still yeah. highly relevant. Yeah, yeah. But, but back in 2008, uh, yeah, sending an email, to a group of 12 people is theoretically, uh, fills, fulfills that publication, uh, publication criterion. Yeah. So the question of what's defamatory, there are various tests that are used, but in broad terms, the test that's usually used in Australia is would it cause an ordinary reasonable member of the community to think less of a person? So that's the sort of it's, it's, that's the sort of summary. Wow. So um, and you, it's so you can see it's not a very high bar to jump no, over. No. If you if you say something that would cause ordinary reasonable people in the community to think less of someone, yeah, then my that's, memory of the court case is that term ordinary reasonable reader mm. just kept being repeated and <laughs> yeah. repeated. Yeah, and that's prima facie defamatory. That means on the face, it's on the surface, it's defamatory. Um, and so it's not very hard in in some circumstances to make out that first stage of the tort action. Mm -hmm. right. And so in this particular case, um, th so things were published about Mr Haddon. He was identified to or published to a group of people. Uh, the court did have to look at the question of, of though, what, what happens in a defamation trial is that the plaintiff has to specify very precisely what are the imputations that arise from the material that's been written. And this term imputations has a very technical meaning. It effectively means, well, what it means is what is the, the bad state of affairs or the bad character that is alleged, precisely what is it that's alleged against uh, the plaintiff. The, even if the, 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 it follows from what was said, not necessarily literally said. Yes, yeah, so an imputation can be something that's obvious on the surface, yeah. or it could sometimes be something that could be implied. Um, um, and, some, and there are complications which we won't go into about whether it has to be implied by everybody or a small group. But the, 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 that, that is why uh, the imputations and the, the courts take this very seriously. Mm -hmm. So I will just, and now what you read before was a, was a quote directly from the case. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's in, you know, that's private. It's, it's public. It's yeah. public. I'm going to just briefly read the imputations uh, that the judge alleged or that were claimed to have been uh, conveyed by this email mm -hmm. by the plaintiff. Mm -hmm. So the plaintiff claimed that there were five imputations, that the plaintiff sexually harassed female members of the congregation by introducing inappropriate sexual topics, that the plaintiff sexually harassed female members of the church by inappropriately touching and kissing them, that the plaintiff so conducted himself towards female members of a church congregation to warrant complaints being made against him that he'd made unwanted sexual advances to them, Fourthly, that the plaintiff is a sexual predator who preys upon female members of a church congregation. And fifthly, that the plaintiff is unfit to be a member of his church as he behaved in an offensive manner towards a number of female members of the congregation. Now, you've just heard me read that. Those who are just listening to this rather than following it on, in text will say, hey, they pretty well all sound similar, but they're very subtly different from each other, some of them, and some of them not so subtle. So particularly, they increase in severity. And the final two, that the plaintiff is a sexual predator or that the plaintiff effectively should be expelled from the church, 
the judge found, while the plaintiff pleaded those imputations, the judge found that those imputations did not arise from the email. So your email did not go so far as to say he was a sexual predator. Your email did not go so far as to say he should be expelled from the church. You talked about pausing coming to church, but you didn't say mm -hmm. you should immediately mm -hmm. be expelled. So those two final imputations were rejected by the judge. And what that meant was there was no need to further consider those in the litigation. But the first three imputations were found to be conveyed by the email. Imputations about sexual harassment through inappropriate sexual topics um, and inappropriately touching and kissing and, and the, the, the complaints were justified. So at that initial stage, the judge said, yes, the plaintiff has shown that this email was defamatory in the sense of conveying something that would call all ordinary reasonable members of the public to think less of him. Mm. And then at that stage, then the judge has to move on to consider defences. Mm -hmm. Now, the primary and the main defence, uh, I would say, in the law of defamation is truth. The fact is you can say anything you like about somebody if you can prove it in court as to be true. Mm. And um, that's a very clear feature of the current law. So he could prove you are a rat. That's right. He's that's off. right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Dominic could un un uncover my cheese stash and all sorts of other things like that. Um, so yes, and so that was what the judge c had to consider in this case. And to cut a longish story fairly short, the judge, after having considered um, evidence of the various witnesses, and there were a number of witnesses, what who was really um, a masterstroke by our lawyers is um, they asked um, twelve young women from mm. church mm. who had made those complaints to me mm. to come and give evidence. Mm. And 12 young women independently mm. um, came and gave mm. evidence. Mm. And they spoke first in the, or they were in the, in the, defense. the first witnesses for mm. the defence. And so they having, those 12 young women who stood nothing to gain, having stated their case mm. in the, um, mm. uh, in the trial, by the time I was called as a witness, well, the facts had been fairly established. Mm. Yeah. So what I was going to say is that the, this defence of truth was made out. Yeah. That the, okay. the judge found that those three imputations were true, that there'd been um, inappropriate remarks, um, there'd been inappropriate touching and kissing, that there'd been justified complaints. Mm -hmm. I guess the other thing, when Dominic says our lawyers, Dominic didn't have to go and hire lawyers. That was provided by the Secretariat of the, the Anglican Church, yeah, yeah, yeah. Church, because they were some pretty high-flying lawyers. In fact, they were very one, one of them is now the leading, the junior, is now one of the leading defamation lawyers in Australia. Mm. 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 Yeah. So at any rate, so that's that. That effectively, um, at that point, the judge could have stopped uh, because you had been exonerated. Mm -hmm. um, you had been able to show that the remarks that were made were substantially true, which is the, the, mm -hmm. the way that the defence is defined. Neil, there's a qualifier in terms of how all of this applies to somebody else in some other circumstance. Uh, yes, that's a very good point. We are talking about your case. We are talking about the facts that were able to be established in your case by the evidence that was available. Um, but every case is different. Uh, and so, for example, even the, the defence of truth, um, uh, it needs to be proven before a court and accepted by the judge and the jury um, that what was said is literally true, substantially true. And um, therefore, um, people shouldn't necessarily assume that their own case will automatically follow the pattern that your case followed. They should be very careful to get expert advice as soon as possible if litigation looks like it's, uh, it, like it's uh, on the horizon. And so we just uh, stress that, uh, um, yeah, every, every case is different and the law will apply differently in different cases. Having, having said that, um, each of the defences available to the law of defamation is independent of mm -hmm. the other. And so the judge then also went on to consider other defences which would also independently have exonerated you. And what this means is that even if you couldn't precisely show that what you said was true, there are situations where you would have had a defence. Mm -hmm. And so the next one that the judge considered was the defence of qualified privilege. Right. Um, and qualified privilege in broad terms is a defence that has been set up to allow people who have responsibilities in certain areas to make comments about complaints that have been made and those sorts of things. So the, the classic example of qualified privilege is where someone goes to a police officer and says, I think X has committed a crime. Now it may turn out that on further investigation, that X hasn't committed the crime. 
But the police officer, the, the, the statement to the police officer will be subject to this defence of qualified mm. privilege. Because that was because, published? Because we want the police... It was published and it was yes. on prima facie defamatory yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah, effects. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we want the police to have the freedom to yeah. investigate mm. these sorts of or complaints. Even this morning I had a phone call from somebody who was the nominator of a church mm. asking me about somebody who used to work for me about whether or not they should employ them. And... I need to be free to have a full and frank discussion about that person's strength and weaknesses. Yeah. Yes, I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I won't comment on that yeah, one no. particularly. There may be some complexities, but I think you're generally you're I'm right. I'm going to be very positive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think you're generally right. That qualified privilege will cover that sort of thing. There are the way the defamation law, without going into too many details, operates in in New South Wales at the moment in Australia generally, is that there's a substratum of common law principles that are developed for centuries. Mm -hmm. There's also changes that have been made by an act called the Defamation Act 2005, and it has sort of added some extra nuances to the law of defamation. Mm. So qualified privilege has a common law version and a statutory version. I don't think your viewers need to know all about mm. those differences. But, uh, but, the, but the, I think the key issue here mm. was um, the group that the 12 people who received the email were the appropriate people to receive the email. They were the key members of the mm. local leadership of mm. the church and the key members of the diocesan leadership. And yes. so uh, when I thought back about the judgment, um, I felt I was accused of being a liar, um, being accused of being indiscreet, <laughs> and the third defence issue of um, being malicious. Mm. Um, mm. And, and yet the judgment found I said the truth and that I was discreet. <laughs> mm. and but can I just read perhaps a, a quote briefly uh, because um, from the judgment um, on this qualified privilege because the defence of qualified privilege operates where the person who made the statement has a duty or interest to do so and there's a corresponding interest in the recipients in receiving it. That's the common law defence. By the way, the word interest doesn't just mean I'm interested in it. It means... No, that's right. A, cor a, stake. a correspondent a genuine interest, a stake. I have a stake yes. in it, not just I'm interested mm. in it. That's yes, a that's legal and common use of the word the, interest. That's the common law approach, yeah. yeah. And so Her Honour said, Mr Steele had, in my view, a duty to communicate with the inner circle of the church. The relevant circumstances include that complaints had been made concerning Mr Haddon's conduct towards female members of the congregation. Whether or not those complaints were justified or whether or not they correctly stated facts and described Mr Haddon's conduct are not to the present point, that is, she means on the qualified privilege mm -hmm. defence, that tr the truth issue was not actually directly relevant. The fact is you had an obligation to convey these allegations. To not act as a solo person, but to act yeah, in yeah. Co cohort and with other key leaders. Well, yeah. yes, that's right. And because the other key leaders would have interactions with, with women in the church who would have mm -hmm. interactions with this, this person. Maybe the Matthew 18 bring another. Mm. <laughs> so in receipt of that information, it was Mr Steele's duty to consult with senior members of the church in, in order to determine how to deal with the situation. So that was uh, that was the defence of qualified privilege, which was, um, was found to be uh, established in the case as well. And so, as I say, independently of the truth defence that was established. And the last one is the issue of malice. Yes. OK. So let me explain how malice operates. Malice is, is will defeat a defence of qualified privilege. That's basically, it's kind of like you've got prima facie liability, you've got a possible defence, but that defence can be defeated if it's found that it's malice. So even if you did have a notional duty to do something, if in fact when the circumstances were investigated, you had really only done it for an ulterior motive, for, for because you didn't like the person, because you wanted some other wanted to achieve some other goal, then your defence of qualified privilege would be defeated. Malice actually doesn't defeat a defence of truth, you could have been as malicious as you liked if you told the literal truth. No, I don't, I we know. don't, as Christian people, we wouldn't want that to happen, mm. but I'm just saying legally. Mm. But malice does defeat a defence of qualified privilege. But as it turned out, the court examined the situation and found that you didn't have any ulterior motives, that the motives that you had were the ones that appeared on, mm. the, on the face of the communication. Um, and there was, a, you know, well, there was some suggestion by the plaintiff that there were other motives, but the judge said that those weren't, either weren't established or, or didn't, weren't relevant because you did have a clear reason for sending the email that you did based on this particular conduct. Can I summarise what, what mm. if you are going to have to say something, make sure it's as far as you know true, mm. just to the people who need to know, mm. and you're doing it in order for good motives, not bad. Yes. Well, it's, it's not just good motives, not bad, it's 
the stated motives as well. Okay, it, yes, it, it, trans, that, that's a good point. I see. Um, because mm. um, yeah. in lay terms, we use the term malice as kind of good but not bad. Mm. But here in legal terms, it's oh, right. it's uh, the I'm doing this for the reason that I'm saying I'm yes, doing. That's it. why I, I kind of yes. use the word ulterior motive. Yes. The mm. idea because is in, you in don't the have case they led you, did all this to get rid of this particular man mm. in the yeah, church. Whatever. Mm. Whatever. Remember, that wasn't at all your purpose. Now. Yeah. Um, oh. As I reflected on it, if the accusation against me was that I was a malicious, indiscreet liar, and if a court of the land found me to be a malicious, indiscreet liar, yep. then actually I didn't fulfill the characteristics of 1 Timothy 3 of having a good reputation with outsiders. And so I felt that at stake was my future in mm. Christian ministry. Mm. Now, as it happened, the court of the land found me to be somebody who in this case had told the truth to an appropriate group of people, not mm. with the motive of malice. Mm. But I felt my whole future in Christian ministry was at stake. Yeah. So the irony is that your reputation was as much on the, on the, if not more on the risk than the plaintiffs. Well, certainly. From your point yeah, of view. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember one senior brother saying to me, Dominic, we would have stood with you. And I'm sure he would have. Um, but I think as I reflected on, I mean, 1 Timothy 3 is actually quite clear, a good reputation with outsiders. And it would seem to me that, mm. I mean, no doubt we would have appealed whatever, but if a court of the land says you are an indiscreet malicious liar. Not just 1 Timothy, but our own church has, has, has tribunals like and, and, yeah. and, 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 and processes to deal with a yeah. situation Yeah, and so like that. I've, I definitely felt yeah. that, I mean, and actually if you've acted maliciously, well, then um, the defamation insurance doesn't work. <laughs> and so not only have you got no future in this profession, but you are s s personally liable. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? That, I hadn't realised that. It's interesting. This became a zero-sum situation then, effectively. The plaintiff or the defendant. One, one's going to have their reputation intact. Is there a way to avoid that? <laughs> Well, that's a very tricky question, Robin. I'm, I wish I had a great answer, but I don't at the moment. I mean, I think what 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 happens in a defamation case, though, is that um, because of the trial process, it can often be the case that something that the plaintiff has taken offence at gets really ex the rest of his his or her life gets explored, and a lot more comes out, and so you can end up with the plaintiff having. Lost a lot, more, lost, lost, yeah. lot worse reputation, even if that's only through press reports than, yeah. than through, the, through the court proceedings. Uh, but, of course, it's not pleasant for the defendant then to have to be subject to examination about their own actions and their own motives. Um, but there's nothing you can really do about being sued by somebody. Um, but you can choose, if you get a choice, we might, I might come back to this in a second, mm. but if you get a choice to whether you want to be involved in this litigation, well, I you should I think say you don't want to be involved in a court mm. case in mm. that couple of reasons. I mean, I remember our barrister taking me out for coffee a fortnight before the case was due to settle, due to happen. And he said to me in the coffee, I mean, he was a Christian man at the time and he prayed for me. And um, he said to me, Dominic, you need to understand, court is war. Um, <laughs> he said, people think going to court is like a football game um, and that you'll finish the court case and you'll be able to be friends afterwards. <laughs> he said, it's not like that. And um, it has a devastating impact on people. And certainly, um, well, I can't speak for the others involved in the case, but it's had a devastating impact on me. And can I ask you a question about time? We spent in the court so, including Holy Week, Holy Week, by the yeah, way, yeah. I believe. Three, I think it was three weeks. Well, no, it's, well, it was Doing three and a half at the beginning, and okay. then there was another week of legal argument okay. later. Yeah. Okay, but before that, you were involved... two years. And, now, and you were involved in a long time discussion with your, with your barrister and, and solicitor going through hmm. the whole matter. So you spent hours and hours and hours. I mean, long I remember before a court, conference right? call with you and lawyers when I was in the middle of long service leave, <laughs> walking around a national park in the Northern Territory, mm. I just remember you guys were all sitting in a conference room in the city, and I was kind of up there in <laughs> Darwin. And, mm. and, uh, and mm. I mean, and that was long time before all this. Yeah. I don't think people, I didn't realise that until I saw it, 
how, how much preparation must go into a case. Yeah. So oh, yeah. I, no one should, if you think you've been defamed as a minister, my advice is don't, don't let, let it go through. Well, I mean, and that's actually what the scriptures say, that if you can, yeah. you should uh, attempt to resolve things. Yes. And I mean, going to this court case wasn't my choice. And no. we, at a number of points prior to the court case, attempted to we resolve did. things by settlement. And, um, and actually, when it came to allocation of costs, that, that initiative by us of trying to settle things with the adversary on the way yeah. played but, into but that. But the discussion. problem was, you remember, and it wasn't just a payment, for it was why the conditions was that we vindicate the, the plaintiff. Mm. And of mm. course, we couldn't do that without dumping on the people who had been troubled by his yes, behaviour. So yes, we were stuck. We couldn't yes, give ground on that. Yes. Can I say, Dominic, there was one other thing I wanted to mention mm. before we finish, which is that the law of defamation has changed slightly over the last 10 years. Last year, there was an amendment to add another couple of defences, and mm -hmm. two of them don't bear any re um, connection with this. But one of them does, which is that these days, at that preliminary stage of finding a, a, a defamatory claim, you actually have to show that it will cause, or is likely to cause, serious harm. Mm. So there's a serious harm serious. threshold that's now been introduced which wasn't previously present in the law. And what this means is that at some, in some cases, a case can be dismissed by the judge and the serious harm matter is decided by the judge, not a jury, mm -hmm. can be decided by a judge to be not giving rise to serious harm and the case could be dismissed at an early stage. And I, I, I thought now, and mm -hmm. again, this is pure speculation, it may or may not be the case, but Justice Simpson, when, when at the end of her judgment, had to formulate Supposing I was wrong, and, and judges do this, they mm -hmm. say, in case there's an appeal, I will formulate alternatives in case I'm wrong on other mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Had to come up with some figure of possible amount mm -hmm. of damages. She came up with what is quite a small figure. Of because $5,000. Yeah, about, about that. Because $5,000 $5, 5, or under. Yes, yeah. and she said that was because, in the end, the people who received this already knew about the events. There was no further harm, not much further harm, to the reputation of the plaintiff amongst the group that actually received it. So with that law it, been in place... This it's possible that it's... And I'm not, saying it definitely, no, no, but no, it's no. possible that if that law had been in place, that the, uh, the judge would have said, OK, even assuming I find this to be defamatory, it's not caused you serious harm or is not likely to cause you serious harm. And so at that point, we don't need to even examine all the other... No, no, exactly. Case, you, can, yeah. you, can, you could have saved a lot of people a lot of time and effort and heartache mm -hmm. uh, at that early point. Neil, from your working around, a clergyman often sued for defamation. How, how often is this a problem? Oh, I do not see it happen very much, no. I mean, I, I, I was interested to, to put your case mm. men mentioned in the book because it's, it's fairly rare. Um, now, it may be more common in um, more litigious jurisdictions. Our friends in the United States uh, sometimes have a practice of suing each other more regularly than we do. But I don't... I haven't seen many cases where, where defamation has been used in this sort of situation. Country. And it's because I think the qualified privilege defence, if the clergyman, the person, the cleric has been genuine in, in applying you know, the facts and applying the Bible, there's a recognition that they have a duty to, to say certain things. But of course, it's, uh, it's always possible for people to do the wrong thing. And, uh, um, and, and litigation in this area is becoming more common just among members of the public who, who slag each other off on Facebook, as it were. Mm. So it's, it's, uh, it's possible that, that, that we may see an attempt to sue, that sue people. But as I say, I think this change, even though it's still early days, we don't know exactly how it will operate, it seems to me to be promising in terms of stopping prolonged litigation over something that really, in the end, hasn't caused serious harm to somebody's reputation. So like this case where there's been communication to a small group of people who pretty well knew all the facts yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's been no further harm to the person's reputation. Um, I would just say it was a year after the court case that we had to wait yes, for the judgment. Yes. Mm. And um, mm. Mm. Uh, that year was an extraordinarily difficult year for mm. me mm. because, I mean, I, I, I did go on stress leave for one month of that time, but... Uh, you couldn't c make comment to people about the court case. Mm. Um, mm. You, uh, until the judge handed down their verdict, there'd been no final 
mm. statement to make comment to people had the potential to worsen the mm. situation mm. Um, and uh, and so I got quite depressed um, you did. and yeah it was it how was, long was it from the moment the complaint started not, n not the email when, when he complained to it was resolved can you how long that was oh well actually from well from the email was 2000 uh, February 2008 right and uh, the court case was 2010. The um, the judgment was 2011. So that's three years. Three years. But the complexity before the email, I think I first started talking to you, seeking your advice about it in 2006. -ish, you are, you know? so, so six years. Yeah, so it was a long period where um, where this complex pastoral mm -hmm. manner was um, mm. dominating things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or 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 not dominating the whole time, but. Um, but was significant. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, gentlemen, so much Great for and, and I mean, and again, um, uh, I'm, I'm so, again I'm so grateful, Robert, Thank for you, the way that you um, cared for me during that season, and and I actually think, as I've, I've said at many points, that I think I saw the best of the Anglican Church in the way that I was cared for and supported by our network of ministers and. By a bishop whose whose job it was particularly to care for at the time. Insurance policies and other things that, that meant the massive costs were not your personal costs. Yeah. At this point. yeah. Thanks so much for coming in, Neil. Uh, okay. Robert Forsyth, my guests on the Pastor's Heart, Bishop Robert Forsyth, the former Anglican Bishop of South Sydney, and Associate Professor Neil Foster from the Faculty of uh, well, the Law Department at the University of Newcastle, and uh, as I said, the author of the Law and Religion blog in Australia and the author of this textbook on defamation. You've been with us on the Pastor's Heart, and next week it'll be a simpler topic. We'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon.